We are in a series called Momentum, and we are talking about the power of momentum in our lives. And so just so you have a good definition of momentum, we have it, we'll put it up here on the screen. <clears throat> and it's this, the strength or the force that allows something to continue or to grow stronger or faster as time passes. That's what momentum is. How many people feel like as you get older that you've lost some momentum, that you're not getting faster and stronger? Or, or even if you're not old, or even if you are, that it might not just be age, but it's as much as life tends to sometimes there's like blocks that you hit that you're just like, man, it just slows down the momentum in your life. And we're looking at a way to go, hey, how do we get that into our life? How do we get the power of momentum working for us? And what does God have to do with that? How, what, what is God's plan for building momentum in our life? And we really believe that not only to build momentum, but to sustain it. That there's a plan that we find in the Bible to sustain momentum in our life. And we realize how powerful it is because you can take a train, and when it has momentum, it can bust through concrete walls. Have you ever, have you ever heard of that? I mean, if, maybe you've seen it. I've seen videos of it, and it's just incredibly powerful that to stop a train when it's got full momentum is almost impossible. But when it doesn't have momentum, you know what it takes to stop it? Just a two-inch block of wood can stop a train when it doesn't have momentum. So we want to talk about how do you get this in your life, how do you harness it, and what is God's plan in that? And we've been taking a look at the book of Nehemiah, um, not to be confused with Jeremiah. First service, there was a guy last week that said, hey, could you play Jeremiah was a bullfrog? He thought that would have been a better intro. And I was like, you really didn't pay attention. We weren't even talking about Jeremiah. He came before, but we we're talking about Nehemiah, okay, not to be confused with Jeremiah. Okay, got the idea. And so anyway, so who is Nehemiah? So let me tell you a little bit about him, and we covered it in length last Sunday. So if you missed any of it, go back and listen. Um, newbranch.tv, you can watch us. We're on YouTube. Um, we no longer have a live video feed just for people that are looking for it. They go, hey, I noticed you're not there. But it's got to do with our broadband internet, but we do post it. By Sunday afternoon, we should have the message posted. And uh, if you missed last week, go back and catch up. We also have CDs for those of you that are low-tech. And I don't want to mention areas that are low-tech, but like Zuna, um, if you guys... <laughs> You know, I think we have more people from Zoom now than anywhere else, and so just relax, and you know who I am. But we're looking out for you, because I know you guys don't have the speed to keep up with that in Zoom now. So there you go. Momentum. Lost momentum there. Okay. I've really lost momentum. People are leaving now for different reasons. Gotcha. All right, we'll stop that. <laughs> but we talked last Sunday about Nehemiah, and who Nehemiah was is, is he came in the time of Israel's life after the time of exile, or actually during the time of exile. He was probably born in captivity. Um, for those of you who didn't know, the children of Israel, when they were there, God had, had said, hey, you're my chosen people, but if you don't stop sinning, I'm going to send people to destroy you. I'm going to send people to come in, and they're going to take you as slaves. And he kept saying it and saying it and saying it, and they wouldn't change. You ever had kids like that? You keep saying, hey, if you don't change, if you don't... And finally, now the, now's the moment. They didn't really believe him, and now the hammer was dropped, and Babylon came in and took them, and then later on Persia. And so they had been in captivity for 70 years. And where Nehemiah finds himself is, is at a time, the end of exile, where the children of Israel were starting to be able to go back. And he found himself in a prominent position. It may not seem like it, but he was the cupbearer of the king Artaxerxes, who was a Persian. Um, very, very powerful man. Uh, Artaxerxes ruled the world. And the cupbearer was right next to the king. Now, that doesn't sound great. If you understand what a cupbearer is, it means every time he eats a piece of food, you do. Now, I'd love that, right? <laughs> what better job could you have than to eat all the time and the king's food? As long as you like his food. But the downside is, is the reason you're doing that is, is to see if his food is bad. So if you die, then he'll know not to eat it. Because <laughs> there's people constantly trying to kill the king. So everything the king eats, he has this person that tests it. That's kind of a you know, sad position. Other than you're always with the king. Now think about that, even from the king's perspective. You'd have to like this person, right? I mean, can you imagine having somebody every time you go to get cereal at night? Go ahead, and we're going to wait a few minutes and see, you know. <laughs> um, and so that's the kind of role it is. And so he, he's having to be around you all the time, so he has to like you. And then eventually, because they like you, think about it, you have the ear of the king. So constantly he's sitting there, and he's making world decisions for the entire world because he's in charge of it. And he's looking to you to go, hey, what do you think about that? So you're getting to put your influence on world events because you're sitting right next to the king. So it's actually kind of like a cabinet position, honestly. And that's, what, that's where Nehemiah was. And so the children of Israel are going back. And last Sunday we found that he was really excited because he finally heard, hey, they're back in Israel, and he got a report, but the report wasn't good. It was they have returned, 
but the walls are torn down. They're destroying the temple. And we know under Ezra, they went back and they started building the temple and all these kinds of things. But now the temple is being torn down and the walls are being torn down and the walls are on fire. And Nehemiah was just like the wind was let out of his sails because he knows the hope of the world is the nation of Israel. And the, and the reason is because Messiah one day will come through them. And he's going, what is happening? And he, and he sat and he wept. And he didn't know what to do. And we said last Sunday, we said momentum starts right there. That momentum actually starts with his weeping. And you're like, really? I mean, that's where it starts? Vision starts with with the weeping. Why? Because now he finally sees the world for the way it really is. And God is saying, I got a plan for that and I got a plan for you. But first you had to see that. And then we went through a litany of things that said, hey, vision starts with holy discontent. Not just discontent. Some people get stuck. Just being discontent. And they go, I got a vision. Well, yeah, you got a bad one. But, but the, the holy discontent says, hey, I see the problem in the world, but now I have a vision for how things can change. That's what vision means. It's a seeing word. It's a preferred future. It's saying, this is the way the world could be like. And we go, that vision didn't come from Nehemiah. It comes from God. And so we said, how do you get that? And we talked through that last week. We said, hey, you know, you gotta, you got to look at who God is first. And then he started to confess who he was. And then we talked about several other things. And finally, we got to the place where he said, hey, after I'm claiming God's promises, I realize what my part is to play. Now, I went through all that to say this. That's awesome. I don't want to take anything away from last week. In fact, if you missed it, you really got to start there. Today's message doesn't work. These are stackable. So if you didn't experience what we talked about last week, you, you, you're not quite sure you even have God's vision. So today's message won't work. Okay? So don't think I'm taking anything away from it. But here's the problem in a lot of religious circles. We have that experience with God. We have a vision from God. And we think that's the end. And it's not. We think that because God gave us a vision, he's going to do all the work. Or we think that God's going to use us to do all the work, and that's not how it works. And i got to tell you, in this church, in a lot of churches, in in fact, in a lot of one of the reasons why we're having struggles in the church world today is for what we're going to talk about today. And if we get this right, it will bless us. If we don't, it will curse us. And I think in some cases, it's kind of cursing us. And if I looked at our congregation, I think if there was a struggle, and this is not about guilt, This is about freedom, okay? This is about helping us get past something. But if there's something that would kill momentum for us, it's what we're going to talk about today, and it's this, that it takes teamwork to make the dream work. You're going, what? You don't think we're team players? No, I think we have a lot of people. In fact, I think we have some of the greatest servants in the world. But it doesn't just take servants. It takes servant leaders, It takes people that are willing to lead service and invite other people to be part. And here's what I see. In in, in our area, you tell me if I'm right or wrong, but we have a lot of entrepreneurial leaders. We have a lot of people that, here's the slogan, you know, if you want it done right, you want to finish it? All right. So you guys know this slogan, see, because that's like a motto. If you had a vision statement for your company, it would be, if you want it done right, I, I just need to do it, right? Um, if church needs to be done right, I can do it. We, we got a whole move that says this. I can be close to God but not be part of the church because we don't realize that it takes teamwork to make the dream work. That without teamwork, God's dream doesn't, God's dream doesn't work. You go, whoa, that's pretty big, John. You're putting a lot of emphasis on team as if God can't do it. Well, God can do it without us, right? He said, if you don't, the rocks could cry out. But can I tell you something? I haven't seen any rocks crying out. You want to know why? Because the hope that God has left is found where? In his church. Not the building, not the organization, not the org chart, in the people, right? And he's saying, if you don't share it, it won't get shared because that's my plan to change the world, is us. In fact, if you don't, it, it, just so you don't think I'm using some obscure passage in the Old Testament, Jesus, before he went to the cross, I believe in John 17, he said this. He said, Father, make them one. This is before he went to the cross. Right before he goes in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying, and he says, Father, make them one. He's talking about his disciples. He's talking about his followers. Make them one, just as you are in me and I am in you. (laughs) Right? You know, he's talking about the Trinity. An Israelite would understand that, right? An Israelite, the greatest command, what is it? And they would say it right away. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's one. That's what he's talking about. One. That you don't get any closer than the Trinity being one. And he says, just like we are one, just like the Trinity is one, just like we are together, make them one. And the Christians are like, yeah, that's what we need. 
So what? So that we can celebrate each other. No. So that we can live out our own thing and our own vision and our own dreams. No. So that the world may know that you have sent me. Can I tell you something? The gospel doesn't work without unity. The gospel doesn't work without teamwork. Without the dream of reaching people for Christ, you cannot do it by yourself. A church of one, it doesn't exist. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. You get in the picture? You can be saved, but you are not tied into God's work, what he wants to do to change the world. And a lot of churches have bought into it. A lot of ministries have bought into it. I can do this myself. And I'll tell you like John Maxwell, you know what he said? He said, you're a self-made man. You haven't made much. That hurts, don't it? Because the big dreams you can't do by yourself. The vision that God had for Nehemiah could not be done by himself. And the vision God has for this church and for you cannot be done alone. And if that's you today, I really want you to wrestle with that today. I want you to wrestle with, well, I, I'm one that I just do it by myself, and I just do it my way, and I just do that thing. Are you really following Jesus if that's your attitude? Because i got to tell you, it doesn't work any other way. Now, don't get me wrong. you got to have the first piece. So if you haven't heard from God, and you haven't wept before God, and you haven't gotten God's vision and his endorsement and his plan, then none of this will work. But when you do, don't think the vision works by itself because it doesn't. Don't think the idea will come across because some people go, well, you know what my problem is, is I probably just had a bad idea. Some of you, you have. Trust me, I'll tell you that later, okay? <laughs> Your wife wanted me to say, that's a bad idea, okay? You get the idea. <laughs> some of you, God has given an incredible idea. And it's not the idea is wrong. It's that you haven't, you haven't gotten this concept. And today we want to talk through it. We want to talk to it as a church because if there's an area that I see, it's not that we don't serve, but sometimes we feel like the greatest servants get in the way because they go, I don't let other people. I don't empower other people. I want to do it. I want them to see that I get my hands dirty, and I understand the spirit. But there comes a time where it's false humility that says I can't let anybody else do it. I can't raise anybody else up. No one else does it like me, and I enjoy doing that, and, and I don't lead. And the answer would be is, is, well, then I guess we need to get some leaders in here, don't we? And God is saying, well, I do. I can develop you. See, it's not a matter of changing who we got. It's a matter of developing who we are, including me, because I'm in the same boat, okay? So let's go through this journey together. Nehemiah chapter 2, if you want to turn with me. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1. We're not going to cover the whole passage, but we'll skip through it a little bit, and you can go back and look at it later. How to build a dream team. Here we go. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th century of King Artaxerxes, when the wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. Now, there's a reason why he's saying that Nehemiah wasn't allowed to be sad in his presence. Um, to, to enter into the king with the king of Persia I'm not sure it wasn't necessarily even decreed that when you go in, you better be happy. <laughs> okay? Wouldn't you love that if you had a job like that where you went, everybody that's on my staff has to be happy. And if you don't, I'll kill you. <laughs> right? I mean, that's where he's at. Right? I mean, wouldn't you love that? I mean, maybe it would just be for me. It would be like, you're just dead to me. Okay? Just go out. You go away. Go, go somewhere else. Go to the other church. No, I'm just playing. Right, but you get, the, you get the picture. You know, they want you happy. You, know, you have to be happy when you come into his presence. But this day, he was sad, and he kind of showed his emotion. And that's dangerous. Verse 2. So the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. And then Nehemiah said, I was very much afraid. Well, that's why he said he was afraid. Because the king saw emotion. This is about the king. The king is all encompassing about himself. And if you read about Artaxerxes, he was. I mean, he did some horrible things. He was, he was a ruthless person. He got to power in a certain way, but he liked Nehemiah. This is a very important part of the story. And so he was like, hey, I'm a little bit afraid, but I did show my emotions. I, I, I kind of showed my emotion to the king. So he says this, but I said to the king, may the, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire? What I want you to see this is this, is when the king asked, this is, this is a big risk. And some people understand there's these times where you have a meeting and you don't quite know how it's going to go, but it presents itself and you have an opportunity and you're like, this is what's on me. So you know what? I'm just going to risk it all. And this could be very dangerous for Nehemiah, but it was, it's the right time. 
And he's like, he had just prayed last Sunday. I don't know if you saw that, where he said, I think I understand my part. I'm right beside the king. But I also know how scary that is. You know what I mean? God, you can't mean you want me to be part of this. You know, the first day you go, man, God's got a plan for the world. God wants to change the world. And then you realize, oh, he means me. (laughs) That's what this moment is like for him. So he says that to the king, and here's what the king says, verse 4. And the king said to me, what is it you want? (laughs) I want you to pay attention to that. Because there's a lot of people that complain about a lot of things. But if you were to actually say, if you were king for a day, you could actually say that in Nehemiah. (laughs) If you were king for a day, what do you want? And they can't articulate. If you can't, trust me, when you get a moment for your vision to come true, it won't. Because you don't know what you want. You've never taken the time to really think about it. You haven't taken the time to really pray about it. That's why last week's message is so paramount for this one. Because if you're not prepared and you don't know what you want, when the king of the world says, literally, what do you want? You'll go, I don't know. I just want to complain. Well, I'm just saying somebody else ought to say something. Yeah. That's why nothing gets done. See, When the king of the world comes and God puts you in that moment, you got to know what to do. And the only way you know is what he did last Sunday, which is to seek God, and he finds out. Okay, so you get the idea. All right, so verse 5. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, underline that because he says this a lot, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I'm, I can rebuild it. You know what that is? That's vision. I know exactly what God has called me to do. You know what it is? To rebuild this wall. And right now, I'm asking the king. Number one, if you want to build a dream team, you know what you got to get used to doing? Ask. You've got to ask. You know, the Bible's full of that. It, one of the people we got to ask is God. He says, you have not because you ask not. Some of us have not because we ask in the wrong way. All we do is complain to God, and he's going, not going to do anything with that. When you actually ask, when you see a crisis, don't throw your hands up and ring them at God. God wanted me to tell you that today, okay? <laughs> so you know. Stop complaining and start asking nicely. And maybe if the king, remember, if he could say that to the king and be so nice about it, you get the picture? But there's a couple things that I see in the life of Nehemiah, and I'll give you three of them that I see that, that happened here in his ask. The first thing comes before the ask. And this is the most important part. And some people go, well, I asked and I got to no. know. And I can tell you why. You got resisted because you thought, like I've thought, see, I'm a, I can be an analytical person sometimes, and I think that because the idea is good and because I can make a good argument, people buy into that. Can I tell you something? They don't. Because you don't understand what, what King Artaxerxes wants. You know what he doesn't care about? Israel. You know who he's never cared? I don't care. I, I went in there, I burned down the city, and I don't care about those people. Those little people in Israel, I don't care about them. They got a God? Well, great. I, everybody's got one, right? That's how they think. And we think people actually care about our ideas. They don't. You know what they care about? You. They buy into you and then your idea. Can can I change that into the church world? Because this isn't just a leadership lesson, although it is. Some people don't realize that in their businesses, and they're wondering why they can't get anybody to follow their great idea, and it's because they're leading with the idea, not themselves. And let me, tell you about, let me tell you about Nehemiah. He had had years and years and years. I have a feeling Nehemiah was not a young man. And he had spent all his years building a relationship with King Artaxerxes. And when the moment came and he did the ask, King Artaxerxes did not do this because he believed in God. King Artaxerxes did not do it because he believed in Jerusalem or in the temple. You know why he did it? Because he believed in Nehemiah. This is so important. Let me say something. People don't believe in your God. They they don't believe in your Bible. (laughs) If you lead with that, that's why a lot of people that are leading with that and going, well, they rejected God today. God goes, no, they rejected you because you haven't spent the time building a relationship so they might hear the gospel because they'll buy into you first and then your God. That's the way it works. Trust me. And that's why he was able to unleash doors that no one else could sitting next to the most powerful man in the world that God had positioned him. But if he hadn't done the groundwork, when his moment came, it wouldn't have made any difference. You get the picture? So if you, before you ask, you want to know why people are saying no? Because you haven't spent any time with them. You know why people are saying no? Because they don't think you care about them. You know why they don't care about our God? Because you think they care about our God and you can treat them any way we want, right? I'll give a, tra- I'll give a track to you. Here's the gospel. Is it not true? It is. But they're not ready for that. They're ready to see you. 
And when they bind to you, then they'll start to bind to your God. That's the way it is. Ask. Build relationships. You know why they're not on your team? This is hard, isn't it? You want to know why we can't get anybody to volunteer or be part of something? Do you care about them? No, I just want them to do what they're supposed to. Well, that ain't how it works, see? Especially voluntary. They don't, they don't just sign up. You got you to you spend some time with them. First thing he did was ask. Second thing he did was this. He shared his emotions. Now, I got to tell you, for analytical people, you're going to struggle with this, see? Because you're not going to want to share emotions. You're going to want to share ideas. You see, his heart broke for the city. You see, he saw Nehemiah's heart before he saw his idea. And if you don't touch a heart, you know, John Maxwell says it this way. He says, you, you touch a heart before you ask for a hand. You, you, don't, you don't laugh and cry with people and spend some time with people. That's why when you go on a trip and you, and you have all these experiences together, you come back and you go, now we're ready to do something together. But, it, but if you start doing stuff and you don't do all that, you go, well, I got good ideas. And the manual says I'm the leader and nobody goes. <laughs> and you're like, what's happened there? What, what's up with that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because it's not enough just to have a position. You know what it is? It's about, do they feel what you feel? And you start to get in sync with people's emotions. I, I tell you, as a pastor, and this might be helpful to some people, I do a lot of funerals, and, I, and I've done a lot of funerals the wrong way up front, <laughs> or meeting with the families. Because in my mind, it's another death, you know what I mean? And I feel for them, but eventually you start to get where you start to go, hey, you got a template, you get there, and you know what you're going to talk about with the family, and you know exactly what you're going to do, and so you can be a little bit callous. And so you come in kind of like a doctor does where they're talking about all these terms and you're throwing a lot of stuff at people and here's how you lead. You go, all right, well, tell me what kind of service you want to do. Tell me what you want me to say about the person. Tell me about what you want. And the person, you can look on their face and if you're a people person, you can tell they're, they're like this. And you ask them a question and it's like you can hear a pin drop in the room. And you go, well, I guess they don't say much. No, they, it's not that. You got to tie into their emotions first. But if I come in the room and I say, hey, you know what, before we talk about any of that stuff, tell me about the person. And next thing you know, the whole family's talking. People that are in the other room that aren't talking, they'll come in and start sharing stories. And the first thing you know, they're crying, then they're laughing, then they're crying, then they're laughing. And as soon as you get to the logistics part, it's simple. Oh, I love you. Oh, you did so much. I didn't do anything. I just listened. See what I mean? If you let people share their emotions, and the other thing, if you share your emotions with them. You see, if you want to ask, you're going to have to get real with people. If we want to build teams in this church, if you want to build a ministry, then you're going to have to get real with people, and you go first, not them. Oh, I'm here to minister to you. That don't work. No wonder people aren't connecting to you. you go, well, that works for other people, but I'm just not a people person. Well, you've got to change. Okay? God made us to care about people, and I'm not saying you've got to change everything, but we do got to think about this. And if you want to ask, you're going to have to share your emotions. You know why he decided to help? You know why the king of the world said, I will fund the wall in Jerusalem? You do understand what I'm saying here, right? This is a huge ask. In other words, like today, this would be like saying, I'll give you a trillion dollars to do whatever it is that you want to do. I don't care about it. I care about you. I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you $12 billion to build your building. That kind of thing. That's what he's talking about. You got an idea that's going to change, and you think this is worthwhile. I don't know anything about that, but I do know you. Here's the money. You know why people can do that? Because he spent the time let it get built. He spent the time asking, and he shared. He was genuine with his emotion. I'm not talking about putting it on. People will see through that stuff, don't they? Churches do it all the time, right? Give me your money. Give me all this. But what people want to see is, what are you going to do with that? Where, where are we going? What are we going to do together? And this guy bought into him. It's very huge, and maybe that's one of the reasons why it's a block for you. Maybe it's not. Maybe you're doing these things right, and you didn't know it, and now you know why. <laughs> the last one is this. Ask for help. Cast the vision. People buy into vision, not need. So he didn't just share need. He said, this is what I feel. This is why it's important. And he could tell, man, this guy's got a heart for this. Okay, I buy into it. I'm ready to help. And he did. Verse 6, then, then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will the journey take and when will you get back? And it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. You, you know what I want to say to that? Expect a miracle. You know what most Christians' problems are? When they actually get the miracle, they're still in complaint mode, and they miss it. The guy actually says, set a time. Oh, I don't know how long it's going to take. So you came unprepared. <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. Okay, no, I don't want to invest in that. You know, I don't know what to ask for that. But this guy actually spent the time meeting with God, praying to God, and by the time he shared it with the king, 
he had something worth sharing. He, he was ready to cast some vision. He was prepared, and he expected God would actually do something. Verse 7, I also said to him, see, he's so prepared that he knows what else he wants to ask him for. If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governor of trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. You see how he asks? If it pleases the king. Now, I got a feeling that's because if you didn't say that, they'd chop your head off, okay? But, but besides that, I think it's a point to us. You know how he asks? Politely. You know what's being lost in the world today? Polite. Kind. You know, even in, even in the church world, the way we ask sometimes isn't like that. It's either guilt trip or whatever. Be careful how you ask. He said, if it pleases you, if you want to be part, if you could do this, if you would be so generous. You get the idea? Not, please do this, or, or God's against you, or I hold up protest signs for Persia. You see who he's talking to? He's talking to a guy that is not godly, but he's going, hey, you're my friend. I'm going to share with you what God is doing, and I want you to be part of it, and, I, and, I, and I'm willing to ask. Hey, would you be part? Yeah, I want to. And by the way, here's a little bit extra. I don't know if you want to be part more, but this is what would make the trip really go. But he knew this detail. If you don't know the details, I'm telling you, then get some people around you that do. There's going to be two types of people in the room. There's going to be people, people that don't pay attention to it, and you get involved in people, and you're going to miss opportunities. There's going to be people that pay attention to all the logistics, and you're going to think people care that you're right, and they don't, <laughs> and you're going to miss it. You need both. That's why it might take more than one person. See, Nehemiah was very gifted, but you need some other people around you to help you with both sides, or else you, your dream's not going to ever work. That's why it takes teamwork to make dream work. You get the picture? Okay. The other thing he did was this. He was bold in his ask. Some people are scared to ask. They become risk adverse. Well, I don't want to ask because I might seem like, I, might, I don't want to ask. But the question is, if God put it on your heart, are you willing to ask? Are you willing to start gathering some people around you? Well, it ain't really much of a plan. Okay, well, then come back when it is. You know, if it's just some little thing you want to do, then I don't want to hear about it. You know, you want to hear about a good plan that's well-funded or else I don't really want to hear, hear about it. See, it takes time. It takes preparation. That's the next part of this, okay? Verse 8. And may I have a letter to Aspha, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for my gates of the citadel of the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. You see, he understood. It's because I went to God and I have God's vision and God's plan and, and I was prepared to talk to the king. And then verse 11, I went out to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, verse 12, he says this, I set out during the night with a few others and I had not told anyone. Can you circle that? Not told anyone. Now, we skipped a few verses, so if you missed those, just go back and read them later. I had not told anyone, circle that, what my God had put in what in my heart, circle that, to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. So that's just a horse or whatever he was riding. So he went out by himself. You know what this tells me? If you want to build a dream team, number one, you've got to be willing to ask. Number two, you've got to be willing to be prepared. Some people think it's enough to ask, but you're not prepared. Some people think the vision takes care of itself. So if I tell them this compelling vision, they'll jump on board even if I don't have all my ducks in a row. That's not true. And if there's an area of struggle that I see is, it's people that get excited and have no plan. And, and they get excited in the moment. So right in the moment they go, hey, there's this great event, John, and I want this church to be part of it. <laughs> well, when is it? Tomorrow. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I see you've never done any planning, right? I mean, you just don't understand. I mean, it takes some preparation. Now, there's, we're we're going to talk about the other side of it, too. You can't wait too long. But for those of you that jump out, and here's what you see. For those of you that jump out and you talk too fast, oftentimes you get shut down. Here's how you know. If you've, if you've been involved in things that you're leading and it hasn't went well, or you've been blindsided by stuff, you need to pay attention to this. You've got to prepare. Abraham Lincoln, he said, I will prepare and perhaps my time will come. I'd put it different. Here's John's version of it. If you don't prepare, it doesn't matter if your time comes. Because when your time comes, it won't matter because you won't be prepared for that moment. And he understood this. There's a great book, if you want to read it. It's called Visioneering by Andy Stanley. 
And he explains, he actually goes through the book of Nehemiah, and he explains how to cast vision. He understand, explains when to cast vision. And for those that are made kind of like me, where you have a vision, you're going to want to share it right away. And what I found is, is this, is sometimes you've got to hold back. You know what God is saying to you? You know what you need to do? Just shut up for a while. And you're going to want to say something, but you're not ready yet. You're still not quite ready yet. They're not ready yet. So if you say it too prematurely, they'll hear the idea and they'll go, hmm, that's crazy. Because they don't see the planning. See, most people don't think big picture. They think very tactical. And if you share a big picture plan with people that are tactical, they'll be going, okay, we're going out tomorrow. No, 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 we're going out in a year. Don't do that to tactical people. They'll, <laughs> they'll start rushing out. You know, I, I remember the first years of the church, I said, our plan is to help plant other churches within the first five years. And I said, maybe one day we'll, we'll help plant a church in Smithfield like five years from now. And all they heard was, we're going to plant a church in Smithfield. Somebody calls me up next week. John, um, I invited my friend to that new church in Smithfield. When is it starting? <laughs> See what I mean? Be careful. Make sure you know what you're talking about before you go there because you may be thinking long range. All they hear is sound bites. You get the picture? So you got to be prepared. It's so important to this equation. And plans can fall apart right here. Okay. Verse 13, by night I went out through the valley gates towards the Jackal well and to the, to the Dung Gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because, why? Because as of yet I had not said what? Said nothing, circle that, to the Jews or the priest, or the nobles, or the officials, or any other who would be doing the work. Verse 17, Then I said to them, you see, you see the trouble we are in, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us. Circle that right there. Let us. Okay? So I want to just pause there just for a second. So up till then, before he said anything, he personally put eyes on it. He personally looked around. He didn't just go by some advisors. Let me tell you something. When you, when you don't do your homework, you're going to get blindsided, and you should. And your ideas will die on the vine. And it's not because it's a bad idea, because it's a bad plan. And you didn't see it coming because you didn't take the time to prepare but by the time he saw it all, he came back and he didn't sit on it. But here's what he said, come let us. Now this is so important, this word us. Because too many people want to go, this is my plan, God gave it to me, and this is what you can do to help me with God's plan for my life. That ain't a team. A team goes us. I'm not planning at all, guys. I don't know it all, but I have looked at it. We do, I do understand it a little bit. I do have the funding from the king, and now, I'm, and now you're planting a sketch that goes, hey, this my idea makes sense, and I want you guys to help me fill it in if this is what you feel like God's calling you to do. Let us rebuild the wall. See, he knew that was in their heart, the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. You see his words? He understood. He was articulating. He was casting vision to them. You ready to build the wall? I got a plan i got a plan to do this, but it only works with us, not just me. And I want to hear your ideas too, but I have personally seen it. So you got, you, you got yourself worked out. The other thing I see about this is this. If you want to build a team, you know what you got to do? you got to start. There's two kinds of people, and, and, and you'll know which one you are. You're either a planner. I would ask you to raise your hand, but you know who you are, and people know who you are. You're either a planner and a perfect person that wants to get it right, and, and you know how much more time we need to make this plan better, just one more day, <laughs> okay? And then we got people that want to push out, okay? So depending on which side you are on the equation, you need to pay attention to what I'm talking about here. So the people that, that want to push out, you need to make sure you take the time in the prep because you're not going to want to do that. You're going to charge out, and you're going to charge the hill. You're going to get into battle and realize, oh, man, we forgot the bullets, <laughs> Right? That could happen, right? we got this great, huge, elaborate plan, and everybody's excited, and we get out there and we pull out our guns. I'm sorry, that's really a bad analogy. In, the, <laughs> in a war, and we forgot, to, we forgot the bullets. Um, this is bad. You know, we're, what are we going to do, bayonets or what's going on? The other people are this. They're planners. You know how long it's going to take before we can go to battle? You know how much time it's going to take before we can go to war? I don't know. How many decades do you got? We're going to sit on this thing, and we're going to sit on this thing, and we're going to make this plan better and better and better and better and better. Until Jesus comes. We ain't got decades. Let me tell you something. The game last Sunday could have went a lot different if Carolina Panthers could have taken some more time. You know what I mean? If they had had a better plan. You know, because they're a good team. And if they had had, you know, if they sat in that huddle and they just planned a little bit better, 
In fact, if they had taken another season... <laughs> Come on, that's funny. I don't care who you are. Uh, <laughs> but they don't have that, right? You got less than two minutes and you got to be there and you got to get this done or you're done, right? You got 30 seconds. You, this game's moving. You don't have next year, okay? God didn't give you next year. And some of you, your plan is dying because you're trying to make it perfect <laughs> and there ain't nobody going with you. And here's how you know if that's you, okay? And I, and I want you to pay attention to it because there's some of you in the room that are struggling with this. And you need some people to help encourage you and shoot a fire under you because here's what's happening. You're seeing your ideas, but somebody else is accomplishing them. Anybody having that happen? Well, I had that idea, and it was kind of my idea, but somebody else ran with it. You know why? Because you ain't doing nothing with it. And you need to get some people that are enthusiastic and firebursters that go, hey, we need to go out ahead, and you need to stop doing what some of us that get older, because trust me, I've come through a season like that in my life where I go, I am the charge ahead guy. I understand that. But there came a season in my life where life hurts. And when you've been hurt, you're more risk adverse. And you start going, no, 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 we need to hold that back a little bit. No, 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 we, we, you know, you're too young. You don't, know, you don't know how painful it can be. I don't want to do that again. I don't want to get hurt again, so we need to plan better. And you hide behind your planning. And it passes you by. See, Your opportunity passes you by. God called you now. God is not a risk adverse God, trust me. He walks where fear is. You want to know why? Because it's scary. You know what I mean? And he's calling you out and he's saying, I know these things and I know you know it's got to be about me. And the fear inside is to say, we have to depend on God. That's why last week's message is so important because if you don't know God is walking with you, you better not be walking out there. But if God is with you, don't sit on this thing. Move. Right? Now for those of you that, that, are, that are charge ahead, don't take that as not preparing, okay? Because you're like, that's what I wanted to hear, right? Both people want to hear the same thing, but it takes both. you got to have a good plan, but don't sit on it forever. you got to start. It ain't going to be perfect. You're right. You know when the best lessons are, and we've learned that as a church, when we run something. You know how we can learn better than anything? Go ahead and do it, right? What, what is it? The only thing we got to ask is, what good is it to wait another day? How much more information do we need to know? And as soon as you go, we've got about it. It's all that we can know about. Don't wait till you got all the information. Do one, right? Run with it. Hey, if you fail, what's the worst thing that can happen? I'll tell you what the worst thing is. Sit on it and let it fail because you never acted. That's the worst thing, right? Because at least you got a shot when you actually act. And when you have God and you have people, and that's why it takes teamwork, because we're all sharpening each other, and some people are saying we're not ready yet, and some people are saying we are, and if we can get all of us going together, imagine what happens. That's why it takes teamwork. That's what God's plan is for us. you got to start. Verse 18 Here's what he said. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God. I told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, after he vision cast. You see the picture? I went here. I came here. I said, let us do this. Trust me, they ain't going with you yet. Then he said, let me tell you about my plan. I have the king of the world who's willing to fund this. They're like, hmm? <laughs> right? You actually have a plan. You mean God could actually do something. And all of a sudden, a vision starts in their hearts. God could do this, but King Artaxerxes is behind it too. This is real life, real time, real miracle. God could do this kind of stuff. And so what did they say? Pay attention. Here's, here's how you know if you're leading. And if they're not saying this, you're not leading. This hurts. But for some of you, you've been struggling with this a long time, and you didn't know why. They said, let us start rebuilding. You know what you hadn't waited for? You hadn't waited for anybody to say that. You go, well, I'm going to do it with or without them. I'm going to drag them. Right? It doesn't work that way. You inspire them with passion, and you move ahead, and they follow. Let me tell you something. You're not a leader. <laughs> if you look over your shoulder and nobody's following, can I tell you something? You might be all kinds of things, but you're not a leader. I say it all the time. People say, I want to start this thing. And I go, okay, who do you got? Who wants to do it with you? Nobody. I want you to send them to me. Well, <laughs> you know. You need to start building some relationships, right? You need to start doing some of this groundwork. People don't buy, and they're not buying into you. I could send them to you, and you'll run them off because there's a reason why people aren't following you. <laughs> Would you like me to tell you what it is? No, you're not ready yet. You see what I mean? That's the kind of thing you're talking about, and the same thing goes for me and anybody else. But you go, they are buying into it. And when that occurs, when this occurs right here, where we're going, let us start, not let me start. Let me run off with my own idea. Imagine if everybody said, I got a different idea and I got different blueprints to build this wall and we're all going to do the same. Well, that's sometimes what church is like, isn't it? 
We all got programs, we all got stuff, and we're never on the same page. But the day that we come in unity and we go, here's where God is leading us to go, and we all say it and we all move forward, what happens? God changes everything because it takes teamwork to make the dream work. Let me tell you something. It isn't just about prayer. It starts with prayer. And God is with it every step of the way. Remember right before he went to King Artaxerxes, what did he do? He prayed. And you pray, and God is in it from the start to finish. But if we think, and here's what a lot of people think, I had this experience with God, and now God's just going to take care of everything. Let me tell you something. He's not. I think there's a lot of churches that are praying. They're praying that they'll grow, but they ain't doing anything. And let me say what's happening in America right now. Every church, every main down, every mainline denomination is decreasing. Did you know that? Not one has reported that they had increase. Population is increasing. <laughs> does, that, does that break your heart like it breaks mine? Why? Because the world is just getting to be a bad place. Well, it is. But you know what the other reason is? Christians aren't coming together. We're not unifying. And when we do, when this church unifies, we can change this community. Now, there's all kinds of ways you can apply this, and I wouldn't dream of telling you what God wants to say to you through this. You know, you read the book of Nehemiah, and you let these words inspire your life, and I think it will change your life as it will change this church's lives as we read this. It might change your business. It might change your relationships. It might change all kinds of things when we grasp these principles that's found here. But I also believe it could change the life of this church. And I want to I share with you just a little bit of a plan for us and see if you want to be part of it. They tell me that, that there's 30,000, I don't know, I'm not good with numbers, but 30,000 unchurched people in Isle of Wight County. Isle of Wight County. That's a lot. We're not a big county by no means. Now, a lot of people claim to go to church. <laughs> and, we're, and I'm giving you statistics that went by the just, just people that were asked when they were asked for their, um, when they did, like, what they do, the census. <laughs> you know how people say they go to church and don't? <laughs> the number is probably larger, right? I mean, because I know a lot of people say, yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I go to church. <laughs> I haven't been there in years, but, yeah, I, when I go, I go there. <laughs> it breaks your heart, right? And my question is this, that's what this church exists for. Maybe you didn't even know that's the stated purpose of this church, is to reach out to people that are not connected to God. That's what we're here for. And we're here to build teams that do that. And yes, we're here to love each other, and yes, we're here to encourage each other, but we'll do everything else better in heaven but one thing, and that's to reach that lost person while there's still time. And my question is this, could we do that? Could we do that this year? Could we do that together? And there's three things I'd like to ask you to think about doing. And if you're willing to do them, then here's what I want you to do. I want you to pull out your connection card. And I don't care if you serve in ministry. I, I re really want to see this so we can say, yeah, we kind of have an idea. It's kind of like RSVPN to say, yes, I'm in. I want you to pull out your connection card, and I want you to write your name on the top and your contact information. Now it's getting real, right? <laughs> and I want to write, I'm all in to do these three things. If you're not, then don't, don't commit to that, okay? Don't, don't fool us, because we're going to call you. We're going to expect that you're actually going to do these things if you say you will, okay? So let me tell you what these things are. Number one, pray. Because if we think we can do this in our own strength, we're fooling ourselves. What are we going to pray for? I want you to pray for the Easter service. I want you to pray between now and Easter every day, if possible. I want you to pray for that service. God, please, do something in the life of this church. Not just so we can have a big crowd, not so we can say, yay, look at us, but so we can say, wow, we saw a life change this Easter. And we'll bring a message that Sunday, and I'll bring the best message I can. I hope you'll pray for me so I can communicate the best that I can. I want you to pray for their hearts. That's the area I can't touch, right? We can do a great service. We can do all kinds of things. We can do six flags over Jesus. <laughs> we can do all kinds of stuff on Easter Sunday, but one thing we can't do is affect the heart. We pray that God will affect the heart. You get the picture? And then I want you to pray for one thing, because here's what's going to determine how many people are here on Easter Sunday. Who you invite. Now, God touches the heart, don't get me wrong, but God's not going to bring one person here that we don't invite. Now, he has. He has brought a handful. But I know that. I mean, we can look at the stats, and i got to tell you, we go down the list, and people say, why did you go to church? And you know what they say? Eighty-some percent, maybe even higher, said, if, somebody, if a friend would invite me, I would go. 
You know why I don't go to church? Nobody invited me. <laughs> so I want you to pray about that. Who does God want you to invite? Who is God saying, you know what, I want you to give that person one more chance. Not just you, but when you pray, and we asked last Sunday to start praying about that, I want you to pray, and here's how I want you to pray, for seven people. Because here's what makes the difference. If you invite them, they'll come. Or at least they might. If you don't invite them, I guarantee you, they won't just show up. Especially the people we're talking about. Is that right? So if you're really in and you really believe in this, and if you don't believe in it, I'll tell you something else you can do. But if you, don't believe, if you believe in this church and you're going, hey, I'm coming here and I'm excited about what's going on, and I really think that if they came on Sunday and they heard a message that said, my life isn't over yet and God has a plan for me, it might just change their life. And I want you to think about inviting them. Seven. Is that okay? Seven people. You know, seven people that need God that you can invite. Now, if you don't know seven people, I want you to think about that, okay? <laughs> if you don't know seven people, and I'm talking about just in Isle of Wight alone, I'm not talking about Southampton, I'm not talking about Suffolk, 30,000 of them, could you get to know some people? <laughs> huh? Maybe go hang out in some of the restaurants, maybe hang out in Dairy Queen and say, you know, I really need to get to know some people that don't go to church. Do you not go to church? Yeah, no, I don't. Why don't you go to church? You know, find some people, please. I mean, if you don't know seven people that you could invite, you, you have a relational problem, trust me. Okay, so, so think about that. Pray about that. I'm not trying to pour the guilt on, but I am saying this. Let's not fool ourselves. If we're not all willing to invite seven people, we're not all in. Okay? If it's the difference between saying all the other forms of evangelism, well, we could buy a big billboard. We could, and we probably will one day, but we're not going to do it this year. Uh, we, could, we could send out mailers. We could do everything on social media. We could do everything else. But when we go, the most thing people come for, and we know this to be a fact, is that they will come if, if a personal friend will invite them. But our friends won't invite them, then I think we got a problem before we start inviting people here. You get the idea? That's why we want to start here. Because we can do all the other stuff, but the truth is if we won't be friendly with them when they come, they'll come one Sunday and leave because we don't care about them. So let me ask you a question. Does your heart really break? Now, I told you, this is going to require preparation. This is going to require some work, right? It requires work for us to invite these people. Wait a minute, if I invite them, then I actually have to be here. Yeah, I got you. So you, so you get the picture. <laughs> and I have to be friendly. And I have to, okay. I want you to invite them. And here's how I want us to invite them. Two ways, okay? Not hard sell. We've never been about that. But here's what we're going to do. On March the 6th, okay? Make sure you pay attention to that date. It's a Sunday, okay? Two weeks from now, okay? Two weeks from now. I want you to bring all seven names, and I want you to bring their addresses. Now, here's what we're not doing. We're not forming a database with those people in it so we can mass mail them and all that. That's not what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to have postcards here that day, okay? And we're just going to let you write their name and address and just a short message to them on the postcard. On the front, it's going to say, my life isn't over yet. Invite you to Easter. On the back, just a short little message, seven people. So that means you got to get the addresses. That means you got to do some work because I don't have those addresses. Don't come here on e that day and say, well, um, <clears throat> you got to prepare. Is it worth preparing for? Let me tell you something. Eternity hangs in the balance. Is it worth preparing for? I'm not trying to throw guilt. I'm just being honest. And I'm saying if we all can't come up with seven people, we don't, you get the, you get the idea? Seven people that need this, then we really got to think about what are we doing? Are we that self-absorbed that we don't know seven people in a, in a small, rural community of 30,000 unchurched people? We really got to think. Are we following Christ? <laughs> Maybe we got to repent first and then do this. Okay, so get the idea. So seven people, bring them that day, and then we'll give you some invitation cards, some small cards that you can also invite them. So do it twice, because here's what happens. Trust me, I'm one of those people too. You're going to send them the invite card and think that's going to do it. It isn't. Because they're going to see it, but they, this time they won't throw it away because they'll be like, hey, wait a minute, oh, wait a minute, somebody wrote me a card. Oh, I can't hardly read it. And they'll have to call you and figure out what you said, <laughs> if it's me. <laughs> but handwritten, so it's not, because let's just be honest, if it's not handwritten, what happens? <laughs> yeah, 30,000 of them going to garbage. Okay, so, but if you get your hand on it, not too bad. And then you call them and say, hey, I, I sent you that card, I just want to invite you. That's it, that's all I want you to do. And let's see what God can do. And I guarantee you he'll bring. Now, here's what I want to tell you about that. Don't be discouraged. I'm not expecting that all seven. Let's say 100 of us decide to do that. 100. That's 700 people. <laughs> More than what we got. <laughs> Imagine that on Easter Sunday. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Other than you're going, hey, man, we can't even fit everybody in the building. I'll be, I'll be totally blown away. That's great. I would expect a miracle. It's awesome. I, I don't think everybody will come. I think 80% of people said they'll come. They won't come the first invite. 
But I just want to cast just a little bit of vision on that note because some people will be discouraged going, well, I don't think that invite card helped at all. But let me tell you something from somebody that got invited a lot. There was a time in my life as a young adult when I kind of got out of the habit of going to church. And, and I kind of went whenever I wanted to, and I was working, and I was, and I was a young adult. And anyway, long story, but I just wasn't going. And somebody invited me to Western Branch Community Church. And then somebody else invited me to Western Branch Community Church. And somebody gave me a flyer from Western Branch Community Church, and I didn't go. And then when I did go, they invited me to group, and they invited me to group, and they invited me to group, and I didn't go for years. But, you know, because of that, I still remember those people. I mean, I know their names. They didn't know that their invite was the reason why I came. You get the picture? But, but I, I gave my life back to God there. I received a call to ministry there. And today, right? That's the difference it can make. I'm just telling you, don't you dare miss out on this opportunity just because you're interested in the instant result. Please, please, please. This could be one of the most powerful things we ever do as a church if we pray. And ask God, who do we invite God? You don't you think he wants to do this? And we come together, and on that Sunday where we fill out these, these, these postcards, imagine if we're all praying over those cards. And imagine that person when they get it, and they finally go, hey, all the bad things that are happening in their life, and they finally go, you know what, maybe my life isn't over yet. Or maybe it is, but those people don't believe it is, so maybe they got something, you know? That's all we want. We just want them to come not, not believing in God, not believing in anything, but going, I know that person, and if it worked for them, I knew them before. Good night, right? <laughs> and they go to church. <laughs> well, I'll just come to see that church. You, you get the picture? That's what we want, and then God will do a work, and people will come to faith in Christ, and those people that you're thinking of will come to faith in Christ if we come together. But if we do it alone, it ain't going to work. You get the picture? And the last thing is this, number three, would you serve? Would you write on there, hey, I'm all in. If you, if you write, I'm all in, trust me, we're going to be calling you saying, where do you serve? <laughs> and if you don't, we're going to say, would you help us serve? And if you say, I don't really like what goes on around here. I don't know if I'd like to invite people to this church because you got this problem, you got that problem. We've took care of the chairs now, so don't complain about that. But, but, but there's other problems in this church. There are. There's lots of problems in this church. Trust me, I know them more than anybody. Trust me, I probably can make a list better than you. <laughs> you know what the problem is? We need you. And it's time. If you're all in or not all in. You get a picture? Is it time mean? Like, in other words, what are you waiting on? Well, that's good. Y'all and do that, but I'm just going to sit back here and complain until Jesus comes. And I'll get involved when it's better. Let me tell you something. It ain't never going to be better until you help. Get a picture? Stop complaining and do something. And you know what that's going to require? You're going to have to get involved, and you're going to have to work with people. Well, I got a great idea, and nobody likes it. Yeah, no, that's why, because people don't like you. <laughs> Spend some time with people. You get a picture? There's a reason. Some people have been jumping from place to place to place, and you're going, they offend me. Well, people do, but let me tell you, here's what it's going to take. Get involved and start loving on people and let them speak into your life. And I wouldn't dream of asking you to come to a church where I didn't believe that the leadership would love you and want to empower you and do the things that God's calling you to do, but you cannot do it alone. You get the picture? And when we come together and become the body of Christ, the world will know that he has sent us. 30,000 people will know that he has sent us. Maybe this year, 700 people might know that he sent us. Is that okay? Is that tangible enough? 700 people might know that he sent us. If we don't invite them, they won't know. That's why it's such a big deal. And if we don't serve, they'll get here and go, man, they don't care about people, and out the door they go. And you know what they'll say? Thanks for a great service. I ain't coming back. But we got all kinds of plans to engage them this year. Trust me. We're going to be sharing that over the next few weeks. And I want you to pray about that because it's not enough just to get them in the door. We want to keep them this year. We want them to come and we want to be so inviting that they come back and they receive God and they start doing his thing and this thing will just perpetuate. You get the picture? Not talking about a growth plan, not talking about any of that. We're just talking about Jesus' simple discipleship model that will change the world. It will change. If we do this, it will change our church. If we do this, it will change your life. It will change this church. It will change this community. It will change this country. If we change this country, it will change this world. You believe that? Would you stand with me to pray? Please don't forget, if you're really doing this, write all in. I'm going to look for it. All right, let's pray. Father God, we come before you today. And um, Lord, <laughs> It's all good when we can say, Lord, we need you. It's so much harder when you say, yeah, and I need you to do your part. (laughs) 
I can't do my part because. But God, I pray you birth a vision in all of us that goes, you know what? Maybe, maybe God could use me. Maybe, maybe if I invited this person that's so far gone from God, maybe they would show up here. And I see a church full of people. <laughs> I see a church full of people that have so much anger and so much hate and so much addiction and so many things as they walk through the door and they leave God with that release from their life. And they they enter into processes that will change their life. What if we could be that church, God? We ain't going to get even close to it if we don't invite and then we don't serve. And we definitely ain't going to be able to do it unless we pray. (laughs) So I pray, God, that each one of us will buy into this. Not because of John. It's, Lord, I'm not that good. Maybe, maybe there is a pastor that's that good, but I'm not it. But I believe this, there is a God that has, is that good. I believe that there's a group of people here that's that good, that if we came together under God, that we would change the life of this community. And when I say that, I really mean the one lost soul that needs your help. God, make us that